I'm going to start lying around naked eating chocolate is basically what I've got from this book. Hi and welcome to my channel, I'm Simon and today I'm back with my first wrap up of the year which is also technically therefore my 10 favourite books of 2021 so far and my January wrap up part one. Wow, what a trilogy all combined into one video. Anyway, before I start telling you all about the books that I've read, I just wanted to mention that you can win some books. <gasps> one of these, well, one of each of these, or one of you can win a different one of these each over on my Instagram. This is uh, Marianne Key's Grown Ups, which myself and Melanie are reading for our next book club. There you go, there's the cover. And they've uh, brought it out in these four fabulous paperbacks in these gorgeous colours. So uh, yeah, head over there if you fancy winning a book. It's open internationally. It's open until Sunday, midnight, GMT. There we go. On to my first wrap up of the year, which I have to admit, I've been a little bit nervous about, which is why it's delayed. Um, I got into a, not a bad space with wrap ups last year, but I definitely wasn't, I just wasn't wanting to do them and I don't know why and then it became a big thing and then I did that one massive uh, wrap up of everything sort of from mid to the end of August until the end of the year and sort of felt all like I was going to say clean and flushed out making it sound like a bookish constipation but I kind of did. I don't want that to happen again this year so I'm getting around to doing this now. It does mean that there will be a second wrap up either next week or the week after for January. I am really superstitious about the first book that I read every year and I picked a corker, I'm pleased to report, and um, it was Black Sunday by Tola Ratimi Abraham, and I absolutely loved this. This book was sold to me from the blurb, because I hadn't really heard that much about it, as being a book about two sisters in Lagos in Nigeria in the 1990s, or starting there and moving on. And actually, it's about two sisters and their two brothers, who are essentially orphaned when they are both sorry, when both of their parents um, abandon them, go to live with their grandmother, who's quite a matriarch, to put it politely, and how their lives follow as these siblings that were once really close really divide in terms of their relationships, um, particularly between the two sisters who kind of uh, take the centre stage, which are Bibike and um, Ariki. I hope I've said that right. Bibike kind of uh, just wants a happy life. She she just wants to get on and get through. And whereas her sister does the same, but with a very godly intent. And uh, what I love, absolutely loved about this book is these two women, particularly the brothers, Andrew and Peter, I enjoyed their narratives. And what I thought that Tola um, Ratimi Abraham does amazingly is through the brothers and through the whole novel, but really interestingly with the bro brothers, is she looks at how women are treated in society. And there is one scene where um, one of the brothers is at school and something happens to one of the female pupils that will haunt me quite possibly forever. I should say it's quite traumatic to read, so just to let you know that. And there are other traumatic elements within the book. Um, but yeah, Tola creates through this sort of siblings set of stories, this sort of bird's eye view of what it is like to have been a woman in the 1990s going into the noughties and beyond. So it's a really, really, really fascinating look. And the other bit that I loved was, particularly with the sisters, sorry, as I was saying, is the way they are drawn so multifacetedly and actually particularly with Ryiki. And um, I found her so fascinating. She becomes so, I mean, the sisters start off both very similar because of how they've been brought up, but it does show how when trauma hits in, in terms of being abandoned by your parents, you can go one of two ways. And it's the fact that she's so godly on the outside and yet she's doing so many other things behind the scenes and then how she treats it up. Oh, I don't want to spoil it. Just suffice to say, I urge you all to read this. I just think it's incredible and I can't wait to see what Tola writes next um, because I just found that amazing. And I loved the way it also, see, I'm still going on about it. I loved the way it also um, looked at sort of the folklore of Nigeria along with the religion, but also the modern eye of everything. It's just, honestly, I'm going to hold it up again because I just need to urge you to give it a read because I haven't seen it about enough. And I do think it is utterly fantastic. So there's that. Then I read, uh, my patrons pick this as I get them to pick a first book of, it could be like the first poetry book I read. It could be the first novel I read. It could be whatever. But my patrons always link down below. And um, it was first poetry in January. And they chose My Darling from The Lions out of a selection of three by Rachel Long. And I really, really like this. I think this is a really fresh contemporary look at life through, particularly through the eyes of, well, Rachel Long as a black woman um, on society now. And there's a lot of stuff in here about sort of 
sexuality and dating, also what it is like to be black um, right now. But there's also the poems that got to me the most. I mean, there was one about Victoria Beckham that I absolutely loved. And that shows, I think, how contemporary and, and it is in the fact that she's talking about Victoria Beckham in fashion and sharks. Anyway, the ones that really sang to me in this collection were all about a mother. Now, I'm assuming it is Rachel Long's mother, but I don't know that for a fact. But those ones were just absolutely stunning about um, the sort of the power of this woman and the mothering nature of this woman, but also her hair and and all the stuff around hair, um, particularly around black women's hair that, that is, you know, discussed in society now. All of that is embodied in this collection and I thought it was really, 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 really good. I've talked about this book a lot, so I don't feel like, in fact, I dedicated a whole video to it, which I'll link down below. And um, it's The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr. I should say I'm talking about these books in order that I read them. In essence, it begins as the story of Isaiah and Samuel, who are two black men on a slave plantation and they are in love in a time before homosexuality had any labels and this then spirals out as their relationship becomes noticed by various different people on the plantation be they other slaves or indeed be they those who are enslaving and how they react to it some who just see it as being love and that's some of the glimmers of hope throughout the whole book but also those who either see it as wrong or in being frustrated in the situation that they're in, lash out at it. And it looks at how phobias are kind of created and born in various different ways. It looks at how we continue to love despite all odds. And one thing that I really, really loved about it particularly, and I'm doing very well, because normally when I talk about this book, I get very emotional and want to cry like I did with Hamnet last year. Actually, I would say like Hamnet, it looks at grief and love and almost betrayal and loss in a very, similar way in terms of the raw power of it. The other thing that I loved is that you, you get this kind of choral voice that, that tell the tale as you go along. And it's literally like, I felt like Robert Jones Jr. had sort of the spirits of the past and those voices who have been silenced by history channeling through him as he wrote this and then therefore channeling through to me as I read it. it it's unlike anything I've ever read before. This currently is the book to beat in 2021. Like this is gonna be going straight onto my special pile of shelves of my favorite books. I did read it in 2020 as well, but I read it sort of, the second read I got a lot more from it and it did almost convince me that I should do more rereading, but I'm very much kind of a so many books, so little time. So I don't know how much I will reread this year. We'll see, we'll see when we get to the end of it. Anyway, um, I did a video uh, about why I have such a huge TBR, because this whole room is a TBR. I will link that video down below. I don't know what I was about to say, then the two, whatever. TBR, this room, it's a TBR. One thing that I forgot to mention, because I'd read this at the time, is that it's worth keeping a hold of books, because I've had this book, The Unfinished World by Amber Sparks, on my shelves for, I think, about seven or eight years, in 2013. I think it was 2013 or was it 2012? I went out to this thing called Booktopia in America, which was this amazing gathering of authors and readers that was run by uh, Anna Michael, who ran Books on the Night Ca Books on the Night Stand podcast, not Books on the Night podcast. Michael had bought me this because he was saying, you really, 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 really need to read this book. It's the most incredible selection of short stories. You'll absolutely love it. And um, he was right, but it took me, and it's also signed, I should say, which is very, very, very kind of him. He is literally kindness by name and by nature. Um, and I miss that podcast so much, Books on the Night Sound. I absolutely loved it. Anyway, he was right. This short story collection I absolutely loved. And it's quite odd because I know his taste and we chime on it. After he'd bought me this, I proceeded to buy every other Amber Sparks books. They're all on my shelves over there. One of the things that I'm really wanting to do this year is read more books off of my shelves um, and sort of shop my shelves a bit more. But also I'm trying to do a one in one out rule and I'm going to be doing a sorting my shelves video um, after the end of this month to see how I do and how many books I have to cull and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's all beside the point. What I was basically going to say was I chose this because I wanted some short stories because I want to read more short stories this year. And because I had so many of her books, I was like, right, I'm going to head to this one. I loved this because it was so utterly fantastical. It's kind of a bit Black Mirror-y, but I would say a little bit more fabulous. Is that what they say? Fabulistic? Fabulous? 
fabulous fantalist anyway it's a bit more that and um, so it's not quite as dark although there are some darker moments in it so for example there's one story well the first story i have to say about because i absolutely loved it and that's one that's really really stayed with me ever since although i loved all the others a lot too and um, and that is about a cleaner on a spaceship now i don't generally like books set in space but i blinking loved this because it was all about why she was cleaning in space what her life had been before and then how she was interacting with other people on the ship and i just thought it was brilliant it's one of my favorite short stories now there was an amazing short story about um uh, somebody who has to time travel to try and make sure this painting doesn't end up in a museum and no matter whether they like make something calamitous happen to um, the artist or to the model or they shift things around still that painting still seems to happen until they do something really drastic um, and so that's kind of what i would say about this collection it's very otherly in terms of it all feels really out of this world and yet all the things it looks at are very much like, be it about art or be it about love or be it about unrequited love or all these different things, all the emotions are in all of these out of this world stories, even if they're not all out of this world because a lot of them are in this world, but it's a different different world and anything's possible pretty much in every story. So that's what I would say about that. Really, really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to reading a lot more of hers. I have um, Grace over at GK Reads, a channel I love, which I'll link down below to thank for um, this book, which I read, or the next book that I read. Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. I've had this on my shelves for ages and ages. Hasn't it got the most gorgeous cover? And I've been meaning to read it for a long time. And it all seemed to be very auspicious because Grace did a video where she was talking, where she was asking people to pick her next reads. Then it turned out that I'd retweeted Robert Jones Jr's list of books he would see as recommended slash required reading this was on that list Sarah Women then messaged me and said oh my god you have to read this book it's one of my favorites ever get to it then it also turned out it was her or would have been her birthday so I was like messaging Grace I was like oh my god I think I want to read this now shall we do a buddy read bless her she had a migraine so she didn't want to but I selfishly went ahead and read it and devoured it in two days so after the whole story about the story, what is the story rather than the story of how I came to read it, which may or may not be fascinating for you at all. I'm so sorry. This is all about Janie, who at the start of um, the book, her husband has died and she's all the villagers around her are talking about her and not to her. And then she starts to tell her friend her story as they sit on the back porch. And we then listen to that story of how when she was younger, um, she was living with her grandmother because her mother abandoned her. And we find out more about um, her mother and how her grandmother had her mother. I won't spoil anything. Um, then she is caught kissing a boy by her grandmother. And so her grandmother sends her away to go and marry a much older man called Logan. Logan doesn't really care for her and sort of just ignores her. So she ends up running away with another man, um, Joe, uh, before we then follow. I won't see what happens there. But before we then find her um, left in a very different circumstance to the one that she was born into and taking on a younger lover, Virgil Woods is his name. I mean, that not that like the most brilliant name, Virgil Woods? Um, but is also known as Tea Cake. And we follow on that relationship, which whilst tricky in lots of different ways to Janie is real love. And this whole book looks at what is real love and how we we won't find, and I'm sorry to break this all to you like I did, the fact we won't read all the books ever in our lifetime that we might want to in that video that I talked about with my TBR, but I'm gonna do it again. You can't find a perfect love. Perfect love is imperfect. That's just the nature of love. And I loved that about it. I also loved, as somebody who's been divorced, oh, she doesn't actually get divorced, <laughs> but the fact that, um, second love and finding love in the future and and if it doesn't all work out there's still hope for the all these things are in there but also i think most importantly actually and what i should have mentioned at the beginning is this is a story about a woman who starts off quite meek and um obeys everything but slowly but surely finds her voice and her stance and her womanhood and her power as she goes along and that i found incredible the ending was possibly like when i finished reading this i was like it's a five star it's five star the more i thought about the ending i'm not so sure about it so i think it might have gone down to a four star for me which is interesting because the four star that i'm going to talk about shortly has gone up to being a five star um but yeah i thought this was absolutely incredible and if you've not read it do read it and i really really want to read more of zora neil hurston's books so at some point i'm sure you will see more of them entering this house not yet but at some point so on to a poetry collection which i read um, as I bought all three of this author's slash poet's 
poem collect poetry volume because I was going to read the second one for Winter Book Hibernation, which is happening right now. Because that was the second one, and being a bit of a completist, I wanted to read the first one first. So, the author is Maggie, slash poet, is Maggie Nelson, who I have absolutely loved reading the non-fiction of. I thought The Argonauts was amazing. It's a book I describe as taking the top of your head off, pouring loads of ideas into it, putting the top of your head back down and shaking it and say, go away and have a think about this. Um, so, I was really intrigued, and these are such beautiful editions. I mean, they've got French flaps and everything. Anyone else find French flaps slightly giggling juicing? I do. I have to say, I enjoyed being submerged, which is well, not ironic, apt, um, as I read this in the bath. I enjoyed being submerged within this book, within this collection, sorry, but I don't remember every single poem. Um, the ones that I do remember particularly are January 27th, 1984, which is the most heartbreaking poem I think I have ever read. Um, it's about a man's final night as he dies unexpectedly. And it's just so beautifully written. I don't know if it was a family member. I feel it could have been Maggie Nelson's father, but I'm not sure. I don't want to say that 100%, um, but that I found beautiful. And then there's another really short poem called The Pools, which is all about swimming and love. And I think it's only about seven or eight lines, but literally is so beautiful about love and how within just those lines, she compares the two and it's just utterly remarkable. But I will go back and read more of this um, collection as as I will read the other two, obviously. Um, but yeah, I thought I thought it was good, but I can't remember every single poem, but those two poems at the same time stand out so much like it was worth it for that alone, those two experiences alone. Oh, I'm rusty. I'm rusty, rusty, rusty at wrap-ups. I do apologise. Right. The next book that um, I read is the one that has gone from four stars to five stars, and that is Things I Don't Want to Know by Deborah Levy. I absolutely bloody loved this. I'm a big fan of Deborah Levy's fiction. I'm a big fan of her as an author and a person. I've had the pleasure of hosting events with her before, and I think she's just an incredible mind and an incredible woman. Um, this, I, I don't know quite what I was expecting heading into her nonfiction, for that is what it is. And also it is a response to George Orwell's um, Why I Write. I think it's Why I Write. I've got it in front of me. It's what actually this camera is standing on along a selection of books, including that one. Um, and I haven't read that and I didn't feel that I needed to. I might have got an extra something out if I did, but it was still five stars. So either either or. It, it starts off when Deborah Levy is going through something quite traumatic. She hints at what it might be, but she doesn't officially tell us. So she goes to escape from everything. She gets some flight. One thing that I loved is she talked about how um, after going through this awful time, she's reading one particular book by Gabrielle Garcia Marquez about, and she gets this idol. And I was instantly like, I'm so on board with you here. And I love it when authors do that, where there's a little nod and you chime with them and that's it. Like, if I hadn't met her before and had conversations before, this would have won me over to her anyway. This just won me over even more because she talks about a fictional character in that book who just lies around eating really expensive exotic chocolate and how she becomes like an icon. I agree. I'm going to start lying around naked eating chocolate is basically what I've got from this book. No, there's so much more. When she um, gets to her destination, after getting a little bit lost, which sparks a whole thing around loss, um, she starts to go back and look on her childhood when she was growing up in South Africa in the apartheid. And her father, who's very progressive, is taken away and put in prison. She is then left with her mother and her brother. However, she ends up having to go and live elsewhere. And it gives you this insight into her and her life and I guess in a way her the formation of her character and the formation of her wanting to write um, and I just absolutely loved it I also loved when they then moved to England later on and all the juxtaposition there that she talks about just it's just a really really good book. it's it's something that you can read in a couple of hours I have to say I'm all about font this year and this is one of my favorites another beside the point I I genuinely thought this was really really phenomenal I can't wait to read I've got it here right here uh the cost of living which is the next in her sort of biographical writings and uh, then I believe the third one is coming out this summer if you are looking for a bit of adventure and a good old romp at the beginning of a new year and let's be honest who isn't here it is in book form it is outlawed by Anna North which is getting a lot of buzz because it's been chosen as a Reese Witherspoon uh, book club pick and I can totally see why this just charmed me from the off grip me and I could not put it down. Um, I read this I think in a couple of days and just was like lost in the world so completely. I'm beginning to come a 
Oh, I'm beginning to become a huge fan of westerns written by women with like a modern, a huge fan. I read these, how much of these hills is gold last year. Absolutely love that. Now I love this one. I'm going to read Inland by Tia or Break Next and see how I get on with that one. But it's definitely something that I'm becoming much more interested, especially when like this one and like actually with um, C. Pam Zhang's book, they look at uh, found family, what constitutes family, difference, queerness, gender bending, all those brilliant things set in this Western sort of, I guess it's something that we all know because whether you watch them or not, you know what a Western is as soon as somebody says it. So there's that element too. I don't know. Anyway, they're playing with that form, which I love. And they're playing, not playing with that form, they're playing with that genre. So what's this about? Good question. <laughs> it's about Ada, who when we first meet her is very excited because she's about to get married. Uh, we follow her through the early um, newlywed days uh, where she's kind of lost in the wonder of it all. However, um, as their relationship goes on, she can't conceive, even though she ends up trying in some quite unusual ways, which I won't spoil because I want you to read it. It's set in the uh, 1890s after the Great Flu, where people need to reproduce because they need the communities to get bigger. And if you can't conceive and you can't have children, um, you are deemed a witch and you will be hanged. Now, Ada escapes that with the help of her mother. I won't say any more than that, but she ends up being part of the Hole in the Wall gang, a gang of outlaws who are infamous. They put the fear into the hearts of all men. They do lots of daring do and lots of stealing of stuff. And um, she joins them. But then we realise that this group of outlaws is actually a group of very much ostracised people who were rejected by society and even their loved ones. And that's the bond they have almost this fan family. So also what I love is that Anna North gets you to question what is good and what is bad and all the things in between. I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. I think it looks at certain subject matters that are very apt now in a really interesting way. It looks at friendship. It looks at love in all its forms. Like I said, it's gender bending. It's queer. It's got all of that in it. Oh, it's just brilliant so uh, yeah that's probably going to be one of my books of the year now i went into this penultimate book thinking that it was going to be twee and i would really really not like it and i was absolutely wrong because it brought tears to my eyes everybody it's the boy the mole the fox and the horse by charlie maxke i don't really want to give too much away from this book other than it is the tale of as it mentions the boy the mole the fox and the horse and these four unlikely friends who meet I don't even know if it's set over one day or whether it's set over a few days, but each one of them brings hope and joy to the other and contextualises their life. And you could open this book at any page and learn something. So for example, sometimes I worry you'll all realise I'm ordinary, said the boy. Love doesn't need you to be extraordinary, said the mole, with these beautiful illustrations. I'll show you another couple. We often wait for kindness, but being kind to yourself can start now, said the mole. Um, and like I said, I thought it was going to be really tweet and I didn't think I'd like it. Um, I also love the fact that the mole is obsessed with cake. I really, really resonated with, or that really resonated with me. And like I said, it could be deemed as really twee, but it just sparked joy in me and hope. And this is a book that I could take off the shelves anytime I'm feeling a bit uh, and pick up, flick through a few pages and just feel better. And what more joy could there be and what more power could there be in books than that. And this I love as well because it would appeal to anyone of any age. And I think that's really, really phenomenal. So more for me for being such a cynic, but I absolutely really, really love this. So uh, yeah. And then last but not least, some non-fiction. Have I mentioned any other non-fiction? No. Hello. Some non-fiction, which I was recommended this by Alan Carr of all people on Instagram. He said that I should read it. So I did. And I listened to it actually on audiobook and it was read by... Um, David Morrissey, who, oh, whoa. honestly, he's got the sexiest voice. I don't fancy him at all, IRL, as the kids say. In my ears, whew, this was spooky and sexy, and I didn't know quite what was going on. And actually, that does lead up to it, because this book gets... It leads down a genital path. But anyway, let's move on. So this is all based on the true haunting of Alma Fielding, which happened in the 1930s. Um, and we, we hear of how her story becomes known to the press and how it also becomes known to Nandor Fodor, who is a... Um, uh, psychic invest... No, what's the word? He basically investigates psychic 
phenomenon and is trying to prove that ghosts might exist and is really trying to find real cases where this happened. So he wants to find out more from Alma Fielding. Now, what Kate Summerscale does, which I thought was brilliant, is she gives us his history and Alma's history. And she also, and in giving as his history, you understand how he might or might not want ghosts to be real and why. You then learn about Alma and like how likely or unlikely it is what's going on with her. Is she really being haunted by this poltergeist? Why is she finding mice in her bags? Why can she suddenly make items of jewellery suddenly appear that she's seen in a shop or they've all seen in a shop, etc. I have to say the first part particularly I was really getting freaked out by and every time there was a noise in the house or anything I was like <gasps> really 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 jumpy. This is why I read it really really slowly and ended up, it took well over half a month to listen to and also just because David Morrissey was so sexy and I could not take it. But what it then also does which I thought was brilliant as it goes on is Kate Summersgale puts this case not only in um, comparison slash context with all the other cases that were happening and there was a huge amount of paranormal cases or supposedly paranormal cases going on at the time um, and so she sort of lays all that and investigates that, but she also puts what was going on in the world at the time. So how things were in terms of wars that have been and gone, but also wars that were on the horizon and how unsettled everybody was in all sorts of different ways. And that I really, really, really enjoyed about it. So, um, yeah, I thought it was a really strong, I really loved Kate Summerscales and the, suspic the suspicions of Mr. Witcher. Um, and I very much enjoyed this too. I've got a few more of hers on the shelf, so I'm gonna head to that too. There is part of me that thinks, apart from the joy of David Morris's sexy voice, which I sound like I'm obsessed about, maybe I was. I think I would have rather have read this one because there's a lot of facts and stuff that you get, which I kind of wish I'd been able to know. And because I was going about my business listening to it, um, I didn't stop as much as I would. So yes, maybe that means it needs to be a reread talking about me earlier saying that I might need to reread things more. But yeah, really, really enjoyed it. So thank you, Anna, very much for recommending. There we go. See, it's lovely when other people recommend me books that I've got on my TBR or already in the house, because then I'm more likely to head them. So always don't feel like you can't recommend me a book, basically basically. But also don't be upset if I say, oh, I've already read that, but thank you very much. Um, so there we go. You'll have had probably a really bad jump cut there because I went off on such a tangent. It was so pointless that you didn't need to see it. But um, please, in the comments down below, let me know if you've read any of these books and what you thought of them. Let me know what you've read in January so far or what you read in the first half of January. Also, I would love to know because I'm so superstitious about the first book I read every year and what that might mean for the rest of the year reading wise i would really really love to know in the comments down below what you read first this year and why you chose it and all those kind of things and uh, yeah i will be back on sunday with a live with not just tom reed's things but also my mother so hopefully you'll join us for basically a good old chinwag about books as part of the finale to um winter book hibernation i will see you all then i'll probably be wearing this jumper actually bye